I thought today we would do something a little bit different. So rather than talk about books, I wanted to talk about writing. I kind of hinted at this when I was looking at Reddit posts. <laughs> and this is something I've had in my head for a little while because I follow r slash writing. And if you are a fellow writer and you also browse at Reddit, there might be some questions that you'll see popping up over and over again. <laughs> so bit by bit, I've been compiling a list of the top five questions that I see on r slash writing and I wanted to help answer them. I've written two books so far. I will put a link to them somewhere at the end if you're curious. Uh, I've attended writing events as I have mentioned in a previous video. <laughs> um, so I'm not a best-selling author yet, <laughs> but uh, I'd like to think that I have enough experience that I can offer some advice uh, to new writers because understandably it is new writers that are asking these questions. Um, but hopefully there's something in this video for everyone. So let's get started. Number one, my idea isn't original. Should I continue? Firstly, yes. <laughs> so this is something that uh, early writers worry about way too much. Uh, I was exactly the same. You know, you really think, you know, when we start out, we think that um, the idea that no one's done before is the key <laughs> to success. And okay, yeah, that can be a part of it. Um, there's definitely books that I read now where I think, ah, oh, I wish I had that idea. Um, you know, take Mistborn, for example, that magic system. Ah, oh, you know, like tie something to a different kind of metal. And oh, it's, and people get to fly around. It's amazing. <laughs> um, but the thing is, there's also a lot of, parts of stories and tropes that get used again and again and aren't original. You know, we, we could even <laughs> say that something like Lord of the Rings, which created a genre, was also copying something that came before it. You know, it's inspired by mythology and other stories. You know, some people argue that there is no such thing as an original idea. So there are two things to bear in mind with this. The first is that even if there is another book out there that has the same kind of ideas and concepts that you're writing, they're not written in a way that you would have written them. Your voice <laughs> uh, and your prose, your writing, your own choices will just by definition make it original, will make it different from that other version of the story. You could give a classroom full of people the same concepts to work with and they will all come up with a different book, a different story. Second thing is something that took me a while to realise <laughs> and is actually very important if you're interested in going the traditional route. If your idea is like someone else's, that's actually great. <laughs> that's actually perfect because it gives an agent or a publisher uh, a point of reference for your book. If you tell an agent, my book is like nothing else out there, it is totally original, they'll go, well, okay, but I don't know what to do with that yet. And it means that they have to work harder to understand what your book is. But if you have a point of reference, then they go, ah, I am actually looking for something that's like that. So for example, the book that I'm currently writing, that I'm very close to finishing, and this is definitely not a distraction from writing that book, <laughs> but that book, I realized that the concept that I thought was so great and original, um, actually had a lot of similarity to Mistborn. <laughs> the concept was that uh, there's these, there are these kids who were like the destined and they were supposed to save the world, but they didn't get the message. And so the world fell apart. 
you know, the bad guys won. And the Shiro Red Mist won. And that's a pretty important part of that story. Of course, his story goes in a completely different direction and is very different to what I've done. But that concept meant that I could say that my book is Mistborn crossed with, and the other thing was Digimon. <laughs> um, so I was able to say, my book is Mistborn crossed with Digimon. If you have a vague concept of what those two things is, things are, then that gives you a starting point. And who knows, maybe in the future I'll talk to an agent and they go, oh yes, Brandon Sanson, we want more like him. Oh, and anime related stuff is really popular right now. So maybe, you know, it, it just gives you that starting point. It helps give you that pitch. Number two, how do you find time to write? <sighs> I mean, you tell me the secret. <laughs> um, to be honest, I've nearly written three books, um, but there was a long chunk of life there where I didn't do a lot of writing because my life got very crazy um, and I was dealing with a lot of mental health stuff. Um, so firstly, I want to tell you, be kind to yourself if you're really struggling. You know, mental health comes first. I'll just put that out there. Um, I'm writing more now, but that's because I've taken a break from work. <laughs> so I'm yet to see where the balance, the future balance will be when I go back to work. Um, I will say one of, <laughs> I think the best time for writing for me was when I was working a very boring job stacking shelves. Uh, as much as I hated a real <laughs> retail job, it was great for letting your mind wander. And you always end up with odd shifts. So I might be working like two till 10 or six till 10. And that meant that I had chunks of time at random parts of the day where I wasn't hanging out with my partner because he was working. And so I was able to write and the writing came fairly easy because I'd been thinking about it all day. Uh, but in more recent years, yeah, it was just a case of thinking it around in the evening for some people the key is to wake up extra early you know they set their alarm a couple of hours before they need to so that they have two hours to work on their writing before they then have to go to work work for some people it's the opposite they wait until their kids go to bed and then they write in the evening and that works for them so just experiment try different things um if you're not a fan of trying to squeeze a little bit in every day, maybe try and book out one day of your weekend. Um, I'm not, I don't, I don't really fully believe in the idea that you have to write every day to be a writer. I do think that puts on too much pressure for people. Um, definitely try it because maybe that does work for you and maybe that does help you build a habit. Um, but, you know, we're all different. Some people might need to write every day. Some people might be better off writing in spurts. So just mix, mix it up, test different times a day, um, try and have a part of your house that you write in that is different from other areas of your house. Um, I really believe in having work areas that are different from relaxation areas, because when you start mixing them, your brain will just want to do the fun thing and relax. You know, I'm never going to write a lot on my sofa where my TV is. That's just not going to happen. So <laughs> I know the answer to this was not brilliant, but be easy on yourself, experiment, test stuff out. Good luck. <laughs> Number three, can I do my own book cover? So I recently got very annoyed with <laughs> some people on Reddit for this one. So the answer to this one assumes that you are self-publishing and that you are treating this like a business and taking it seriously. Uh, that is not to downplay other options. Um, it's just that if you're doing it for the fun of it, go nuts, go wild, who cares? If you're doing it, if you've got like a I don't know, a, a fancy reading group and you all read each of the stuff and you're basically putting it online for them 
or if it's people who followed your fanfics or something and they don't really care by all means go wild do your own covers play around do whatever you want but if you want to take it further and you want to actually start marketing your book and having a go at making this uh part of your income, part of your business, absolutely hire someone to do your cover. Do not do your own. <laughs> like the, the idea that you are as good as someone who has practiced over and over and over and who works in that field the idea that you could be as good as them is just, what's the word? <laughs> it's really egotistical, I guess. <laughs> um, and it's kind of insulting to them. You know, you've worked, your, you've worked at writing, let them, and hopefully you're good at that. So just accept that they're good at their job. You know, there, there are rarities. There are people who are excellent at both. That absolutely does happen so if you are then fantastic ignore this carry on um for me i'm okay at visual stuff you know hopefully that shows in my thumbnails you know i'm i'm fine but there's no way i'm gonna sit and do a book cover that is going to be anywhere near the quality of someone like my friend who illustrates book covers for a living uh, and by the way this question kind of assumes you're either getting an illustrator or a graphic designer those two roles are a little bit different from each other um but hopefully they are both equally good at making good covers um but my friend she's been doing this for years now uh, and she was always going to be the first person i went to with my book cover uh, and how that went is that I had some ideas of what I wanted to go on there, but what was really valuable are the concepts and ideas she brought to the table. I mean, I I think, I think my first book, the design was like 90% her. I think there were some like objects I wanted to throw on there. Um, and there were some other ideas that kind of fell into the trope of yeah i want to show an action scene of all my characters ready to fight and it's like actually no that's not the best way for a book cover you know a book cover needs to say a lot with a little um so what she came up with was fantastic um and obviously just the artistry of what did end up going on there was just like so far beyond what i could do myself um Okay, not everyone's gonna is everyone's gonna be lucky enough to know someone who works in the industry, but you know there are some amazing people out there. Um, even on something like Fiverr, and you know, and the, if you can't afford like a thousand pounds for a book, maybe bring your budget down to like a few hundred. Um, unfortunately, they're the numbers you're looking at, um, and find someone who's maybe breaking in who needs that first start um you know do your research <laughs> and you won't regret it because in my experience anytime i've worked with an artist i've worked with other artists than my friend um, they just can't do enough for you um and you know usually it's okay that makes it sound like they'll just keep working and working don't overwork your artists <laughs> um but you know they tend to have so many revisions that they'll allow um, and they'll ask for feedback but it's, it's not very often i give that much feedback because oh, I've, I've been amazed by the work that's been presented to me um so yes invest in a book cover you will get something so much better than what you can make again addendum unless you are also an artist <laughs> Number four, how long should a book be? So I think there's a lot of better advice about this out there. Um, when I was first starting out, I think 70K was the number that kept being thrown out. Um, it was like 70 to 90. Uh, and it's like, if it's longer than that, agents won't look at it. Uh, 
But the issue with that was um, fantasy tends to be a lot longer, and that is the genre I was writing in. Um, and there wasn't that information out there that kind of split it up by genre. It was just like, yeah, I'll make it 70k. Yeah, that's. <laughs> so with my first book, I was like, I think I was nearing 120k with the first draft. I was like, oh, this is such a long book. Oh my God. But now I look back and I'm like, actually, that wasn't such a ridiculous um you know length and actually it's quite a normal okay length my first book it's not huge i'll grab it so after formatting it was about 400 pages um and this was i think about in the 110 mark territory um but obviously like Fantasy books can easily be over five, six hundred pages. Um, so to tell someone who's writing a fantasy that to aim for 70 is crazy. <laughs> um, unless they are uh, aiming for a novella, in which case it should be a lot shorter. So this answer depends on genre, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> if you're writing literary 70k is probably a good mark to aim for. Um, and with fantasy, uh, when I was at the writing event, uh, the agents there said that the 110 limit was about right for a first time fantasy author. Um, just because agents <laughs> just don't have the time to be reading, you know, 400,000 word books every day. Um, it really is just a timing issue. Um, I will try, I found a recent guide on this, so I'll try and put it up here for different genres and different style books. And hopefully that will be a guide. Um, but generally, if you're going over 110, it's going to be trickier to market it to an agent. And if you're self-publishing, it doesn't really matter. The only thing I would say is that if you want to do print on demand, <laughs> uh, a longer book is going to be more expensive. Um, I think this one, when I first put it up, was about twelve ninety nine. I think. Uh, meanwhile, the or the ebook is like two ninety nine, and you might look at that and go, "Oh my god, that's such a huge difference!" But the profit I was getting back off those two things was identical. <laughs> that is just how much each print copy cost, because uh, print on demand is expensive because you're printing individual books, which is obviously more expensive than if you're printing in bulk. So that is something to bear in mind, but if your plans are just for ebooks, go nuts, go wild, write whatever you want. Number five. I want to learn to write slash I'm not very good. How do I learn? Like, so this one comes up on R slash writing a lot. <laughs> uh, I will try to be nice. I will try to not cynical these are probably young writers so this is a nice space this is good <laughs> so just bear in mind that when you're posting something like this you're asking for a lot that is a very big question you know would you go up to a mechanic an engineer and say oh how can you just like teach me how to build a bridge? You know, it's going to be a very long answer. <laughs> so how do you start that process of learning? I think that's probably the better way to approach this. Uh, how do you start to learn? Um, one, books. There are hundreds of books about writing. Um, what I would say is try not to rely on just one. Get a few because different writers will say different things. <laughs> um, that's not to say that everyone has a different opinion, so it doesn't matter. No, it's just that there might be little things that don't work for you that work for others. 
see what I was saying before about writing every day. You speak to Stephen King and he'll tell you to write every single day. But you speak to someone like Brandon Sanderson and he says, well, actually, it's not as straightforward as that. Um, don't pressure yourself. So as well as getting books that are just about writing in general, uh, try to find things that help teach you plot structure. Um, stuff about the hero's journey is quite useful. Um, I've heard of Save the Cat, but I haven't read it myself. Things about character building. Even basic stuff about prose. You know, I kind of stole a book off a friend because it includes something really... a little tip that I really quite like. Um, <laughs> uh, and that was about the use of said. Um, you know, at school we're told to replace every every moment of said with something else. But actually said can be invisible and it can be just a nice tool to mark who's saying what and nothing else. Um, so you've got books and there's also a lot of videos and a lot of lessons out there. Uh, I started the Neil Gaiman masterclass and I've been meaning to go back to it because I did really enjoy it. He has some great exercises to try and materials and other things to read. Um, there's also of course my NK, NK Jemison, which I really want to try out. Um, but my number one recommendation is the Brandon Sanderson Lectures. If you do not know where to start and you're a bit lost, spend a week, watch one of these every day and you will learn so much. It helps if you have uh, read Myth One, but it's not essential. Um, and this it's also worth remembering that this was for sci-fi fantasy writers. However, there's still a lot to take from this, even if you're not. It is unbelievable <laughs> that this is just free on the internet because Honestly, these lectures are so much better than things that I have paid for. Um, no joke, the very expensive writing course that I went on, um, admittedly it wasn't really a writing course, it was just like a lot of different talks you could attend, um, but uh, the value that I got from these free Brandon Sanderson lectures was so much more than the things I got from there. Um, that's not to dismiss them, there were some really good talks, but you know, they were mixed in with some not so great ones. Um, so I'm not saying this to slag them off, but I just want to, you know, let you know that these are really good. So they're free, they're on YouTube, you have no excuse not to watch them. Um, for me, some of it was a great reminder, but some of it was just like, some of it was a revelation. Uh, one of my favourite tips was talking about world building. And in fantasy, the concept of world building can be quite overwhelming. You know, how far do you go? Do you have a religion down with all of the key, you know, uh, characters in it? Do you have maps of the land, do you have language, you know, do you go Tolkien and write all the languages? Um, but he created this concept of the iceberg. Uh, so you've got the tip, which is what everyone's going to see, and then everything that's underneath the ocean. However, <laughs> he drew a sort of bubble within the iceberg and said, this is a hollow iceberg. The tip is to make the reader think that there's more that you have come up with without you really coming up with everything. So it's a little bit of an illusion. You know, it's it was his way of saying don't get bogged down in the details. You know, writing your book is what's more important. Um, and if you need to fill in those de details later, you can. Um, but I thought that was fantastic. <laughs> so that's where you should start. Um, and if you're going to use something like Reddit, try and ask questions that are more specific because you will get something back that is more valuable, I would hope. So yeah, go out there, do your research, watch those lectures, maybe have a play around on uh, Masterclass or Skillshare. There's probably stuff in Skillshare. 
read books, um, and the most number one valuable thing, read more. This is what people said to me when I was a young writer and I was, <laughs> even though I was reading a decent amount, it was probably not enough. <laughs> um, and if I could talk to my younger self, I would say reading more really is helpful and is important. And one of the reasons why that is, is because it helps you see what everyone else is doing and it helps you see the variety that is out there and the different techniques. So if you're in a little bit of a bubble, um, especially if you stick to one genre, you might say, these are the conventions of this genre, um, which is helpful in itself. Um, but maybe your brain will take away, okay, what I need to write is first person, maybe this genre, you know, maybe it's urban fantasy, it has pop cultural references, first person, past tense, okay, we, we, you know, it's structured like this, um, but then if you read a lot, you'll come across something that goes, whoa, whoa no, no, we're doing the third person, and I'm going to throw in some second person as well, and, you know, that's just an example, but reading a lot of different books, it really opens you up to these different techniques and these ideas, because um, I, I think writing advice does sometimes get stuck on certain concepts or certain ideas of how writing should be. And I think it's good to remind yourself that there are writers that break out of that. Um, I'm definitely a believer in knowing and understanding rules before you break them, though. <laughs> so still read your advice, still go out there and watch those lectures, um, but keep reading. I probably should have split this video up because that was very long, um, but if you stay to the end, thank you for sticking with me. Um, let me know if you have any questions about what I've said. Uh, let me know if you have any of your own thoughts about what I've said. Um, I feel like I've maybe had to rush over certain things. So if you want me to do another video that goes more in depth and stuff, by all means, ask and you shall receive, well, I can't guarantee you'll receive, we'll, we'll see what you ask for. <laughs> um, but thanks for sticking with me. Uh, I think the next video will be back to book talk. Um, so I look forward to that and I'll see you later. Bye-bye.